Hello, welcome to the Sunday Science Q&A. This is the uh, the 20th one, 20th one since uh, lockdown. We've also had erred off course uh, slightly every now and again. We did Sea Shambles, which is still up uh, the uh, uh, on our Cosmic Shambles website, which was about a four and a half hour show uh, of, uh, of lots of different sea mayhem, including a very interesting uh, reading of the uh, of, of, of Moby Dick and bits of Rhyme of Ancient Mariner. And uh, we had uh, bits of uh, British Sea Power and Lemsey Say and... Uh, it was lots of stuff going on and also our Cheltenham special as well from Cheltenham Science Festival where we did a uh, show to uh, end Cheltenham Science Festival um, a few things said today's an astrophysics special so uh, we have uh, two astrophysicists and we also have our regular physicist uh, Helen Chersky as well and so if you have any questions you would like to ask you can just go down to the kind of chat area whatever area that is and uh, Trent will send me those questions or I will also be checking on that we, we have an enormous number of questions so don't think in in no way is this a plea for more questions but if you have something in particular cosmological that you would like to ask uh today is the day to do that and uh also remind you of some of the other things which is patreon which is very important to us all these things going as you probably i think i've got i've got one live date left in my diary now this year the uh the tour has been entirely uh wiped out all of the other festivals everything else i have one date i think left in there i think the third of december tenuously remains uh within my 2020 diary um but that's why we need uh patreon support as much as possible because a lot of the things that we use before to kind of finance these uh we don't have uh anymore so if you are able to support us of our patreon uh that makes things a lot easier for book shambles for cosmic shambles for the documentaries we make the series that we make and all that kind of stuff um if you don't want to go to patreon then you can just support us by uh putting that the, there's a kind of little tip jar at the bottom of this screen if you are able to and of course if you're not able to we totally understand that people are in precarious times but if you are able to put something in the tip jar today as well that helps a great deal um some of the other things up to as well as all the science shambles which you don't have to watch by the way we also have audio versions of that as well as i said there's there's uh you know 20 sundays worth and loads of other things that we've done around that as well um but uh, that's all still available and also uh there's um conversations uh about uh teenage mental health uh there's a teenage mental health show and there is the conversation conversation that Brian Cox and I had with Andrean as well uh, which was for the Blue Dot Festival and that was us talking about the the pale blue dot uh with Anne and also about Voyager because obviously she was actually the person who was in charge of the golden record and co-wrote Cosmos and Demon Haunted World and Comet and many other things as well so uh, that was that was a really lovely conversation to have um, and our latest Show and Tell is with Jay Wilgoose of Public Service Broadcasting. And uh, submit questions, by the way, is stay at home at cosmicshambles.com or you can just tweet at Cosmic Shambles or you can just go to the live chat. Uh, I'm going to start with my show and tell before I introduce everyone. This is uh, it's such a beautiful cover. I don't know how well you can see this cover. This is the song of the eight. Um, Eugene Murray, who was a very interesting um, South African kind of lawyer and poet and activist, who who uh, he um, he wrote a, a very interesting book called "The Soul of the White Ant," which was about his period of time of observing termites. This is a little trick he did. By the way, "Soul of the White Ant" is actually about termites. Uh, "The Soul of the Ape" is uh, actually about baboons, which are of course a very clever monkey. Um, but this this book is it was as far as we. We know the first time someone basically lived in the wild with a species to observe them properly uh and this was the book itself didn't come out till nine years after jane goodall started her incredible work in gombe um but he actually did this uh in i think it would be the the 1920s and the book though was released 34 years after his death so this is a fascinating book but the thing that i love about it which will mean nothing to most of you is i bought this the other day with no knowledge that this used to be the property of john justin now, some of you, very few of you, maybe three of you will go, oh, John Justin. Yes, John Justin, the actor star of the 1940 version Thief of Baghdad, uh, appeared in quite a few Ken Russell movies and is in the tremendously unsettling ghost story Shalkin the Painter. So this used to belong to the actor John Justin. I didn't know that, and now I do, and it's mine, and leave it well alone. Welcome to our astrophysicist who uh, today, um, well, we start off with, uh, because I don't think you, you've you um, not been on in this season, uh, Dr. Jen Gupta, how are you? 
Hey, um, yeah, I'm okay. I'm set up in my dorm, um, and so for show and tell, I was looking round. I was like, I hadn't really realised how nerdy I'd made my daughter's bedroom until I was sitting here gazing out um, at it. But instead of showing you all of all of that stuff, I thought I'd show um, something that if anyone's watched the uh, Family Science Club that I was on um, a few months ago, you might have seen this. But this is a tactile galaxy. Um, so I work on a um, project called Tactile Universe at the University of Portsmouth, and this is all about um, getting um, visually impaired people, finding ways for them to engage with astrophysics. And so this is a keyring version of what we've done. This is the Whirlpool Galaxy. Um, and so what we've done is we've taken the black and white image um, of that galaxy and we've looked where it's brightest and we've just like raised that um, above the base. So it's hard to see on this keyring version. Um, the ones we use in schools are, are bigger than this, but I didn't bring any of them home with me um, during lockdown. So yeah, that's my, my little show and tell. So instead of... Um, looking at the galaxy and, and looking at the shape and, and all of that kind of stuff you can just like run your finger over it and you can you can feel the shape you can start to understand what structure that galaxy would have um, we do them for the different colors as well so if you look at the red light compared to the blue light coming from a spiral galaxy like this um, they'll look different and then we can start talking about why that is the different populations of stars all that kind of stuff just from that little 3d printed galaxy um, that i've got there so yeah that's what you know, show. I was on a project, um, I gave um, a judging panel for an Institute of Physics prize a couple of years ago, and the prize was given to someone who was working on astronomy for blind people using similar things. And it was brilliant, because you would think that that's a really hard transition to make. But actually, she had this whole thing, and there were the, she had, you know, blind people who could feel the structure of galaxies and it was such a cool thing and I was we were all really impressed with that is that is that becoming more common now or is that still a bit more unusual I think I think there is a bit more of a, a move towards this there's several different projects um in the UK certainly that are doing this um so we're tactile tactile universe um there's tactile collider which is doing very similar things but based on particle physics so stuff going on at CERN um there's a lot of different um projects but I think what what sets us apart is we really wanted to get the research out there so this is really based on um on the research of of my colleague um Dr Nick Bond who who leads the project and he is a blind astronomer so he is a he is a rarity um because because um, a lot of people, as they're growing up, if you're visually impaired or you're blind, you just kind of naturally feel excluded from this subject. We've been told stories of like a young girl who was just taken out of her classroom when, when they taught space because they thought she couldn't understand it. So why would they try in the first place? So we're really trying to like combat that and get into schools quite early on so that we want to do things that everyone can can access. So, you know, we again, we don't take the visually impaired child to one side. We do this with the whole class so that everyone can experience the exact same thing. Where, where can people where, where can people get hold of these? Are, are, they, are they is it possible for people to to uh, purchase them? We, we we aren't selling them at the moment. If anyone has a three D printer at home, um, I think that's probably becoming. Um, a you can download the files. All the files to print these are, are available on our website, which is tactileuniverse.org. Um, but yeah, at the moment we haven't figured out how to to commercialize it. I think we we want to because I mean, who wouldn't want a, a tactile little keyring um, of a galaxy? But yeah, if you go to tactileuniverse.org, you can find all the files to download it, plug it into your 3D printer, and away you go. Right, yeah. I've got a question. Right, I've got a question. I'm going to be asking uh, both you and Katie very specific questions because I'm currently on the chapter of my book. I'm writing about the size of the universe, and so this is. So, in fact, anyone who sent questions in, bad luck. I got loads of them myself. <laughs> um, but uh, I, I'm, I was, I've been trying to imagine. What you know, because I think one of the reasons that people get a kind of level of anxiety when they first get some sense of how big even you know the observable universe is is because you can't manage to crush that down and place and make a visual image in your head. So when you are imagining the size of the universe or the observable universe, what kind of goes through your mind? Do you have a kind of picture theory in your head as you're trying to gather it together? I, mean, I, I feel like we probably go to Katie because I've got a very, um, very simple answer, which is it, 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 it hurts my head. Um, so I don't think I've really cracked that one yet. So how far uh, if you if you if you're pulling out because I watched that wonderful thing again, um, Power of Ten, which there've mm. been lots of other versions of that that since, but it still works very well. I think I first saw that when I was eight years old. And um, so, uh, do you have a moment of you kind of pan out, you pan out, you pan out, and then you go, "Oh, I need to reboot myself. I've crashed." I think I get to go and fly the planetarium um, at Winchester Science Centre. And so I did a lot of that, like zooming around um, space. And I think for me, 
I can get my head around the solar system. I think probably because we've sent spacecraft out to all those planets. You know, um, we had the Rosetta mission going to a comet. We've got New Horizons, which flew flew pl- past Pluto. So I, I can kind of imagine that in my head when you when you, when you're in the planetarium and you do this and you you fly out from the solar system and then it's just so long before you get to anything else. And I think that's where my brain goes. Nope, that that's that's it. So in and also when we're because I was just reading about that 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 time between time ga- between galaxies. So that is kind of that's not empty. That is, is it predominantly hydrogen ions? Would that be right? Or maybe I should throw to Katie now because you've you've already kind of said leave me out of this. I'm, prepared, <laughs> I'm, I'm solar system based. I'm prepared to stretch to a galaxy, but I'm not going any further than that. Um, so Katie, we're joined by Katie Mack, who has uh, been with us a couple of times before, and some of you may well have seen on um, Sunday brunch this morning, and whose uh, book, The End of Everything, is one of my favourite. Um, I, I could say one of my favourite science books of the year. It is one of my favourite books of the year. Really enjoyed reading it and I, I would you. love to hold it up now and say uh, my copy is actually used to belong to oliver tobias who was in the 1979 version of thief of baghdad but it, it's just my copy and it was mine right from the start now it's a fantastic we'll talk about this later on because okay. i think we've got questions that reflect on this but yeah what do you when you are because of course your mm-hmm. book is imagining the end literally of everything the yes. whole yes. universe the so end of the as universe. you start to think about that as you start to think of the big crunch or the big rip mm-hmm. or whatever it might mm-hmm. be i suppose the big crunch eventually that you can put that in the waste paper basket of your mind <laughs> really hard not to have to deal with it right we just make yeah. everything look the same because i remember the biggest thing i've ever seen and it wasn't the biggest thing i've ever seen but my brain thought it was and it was um, a tornado and mm-hmm. the thing about tornado is that you know, clouds are normally there, but you don't really see them connected to the ground. Cloud base was probably three kilometers. So I was looking at something three kilometers big, but because I could see, I could see the relative, I could see the connection, right? It was like seeing a line that connected the earth to the moon. And then yeah. you saw it and that hurt. And that was only three kilometers. <laughs> yeah, you know, brain, yeah. I re- that, that was the shock that I can't, and um, I can't cope with how big that is because it's connected. Like you need it to connect two things. Yeah, yeah. No, and then you can put a scale on it. And the problem with like galaxies and space and all of that stuff is we don't have a thread that crosses yeah. the galaxy. And you go, oh, that thread. Now I understand. You know, there's no relative anything, and our brains really struggle. Yeah, yeah. I've often wondered how wondered much, it would, break how much one, it would break one's brain to see a space elevator. <laughs> um, you know, so that would be a thread connecting something in orbit, and. Um, I, I just I just don't know how that would feel. I've, I've I've seen descriptions of it in science fiction, and and I've always wondered like, but what would it feel like to actually look at that? Like, would that would that just? I mean, I remember seeing I saw a total solar eclipse, and that broke my brain uh, because it was just so bizarre. It's just such a weird thing to see. Like you're 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 there's something it te- goes into something primal in you that like the sky should not look that way. And I've often wondered if something like a space elevator would do the same thing. It would just kind of break all your sense of scale and how the sky ought to look. So I think that might be it, that a lot of things which people can, if they want, or not even if they want, uh, you know, attach an anxiety to and then not shift it is something something that actually you are meant to. Your brain is meant to go, and then you move on. (laughs) It's meant to short circuit at that moment. Leave the short circuit. Once everything is cooled, you can then move on, and it will come back every now and again as a kind of memory. I presume your show and tell has been in front of our eyes all along. (laughs) Um, um, yes, so uh, so my, I figured I figured it's it's here already. I might as well I might as well talk about it. Um, so this this chalkboard was uh, was a gift to me from uh, the Perimeter Institute for Theoretical Physics, where I was doing a visiting fellowship. And the reason they gave me a chalkboard is because I was going to be doing a public lecture, and the public lecture became a virtual public lecture. And then we needed something to do visuals, and we decided like. Perimeter Institute is really into chalkboards and equations, so like, okay, well, I'll do the, I'll do all, uh, you know, I'll draw some pictures on the chalkboard as part of the public lecture, and then that'll be like the visual, right? And it worked really well. It was like a sort of Q and A thing, um, but then it turned out that when I was uh, working with my um, my summer research student, also remotely, it was really handy to be able to actually, you know draw out equations and and diagrams for her so that we could you know we could discuss the science and so I, I asked them if I could keep it um, and they said and they said yes so it is 
it is actually genuine cosmology on the chalkboard. And I realized this morning, because this was also in the background when I was on the um, Sunday brunch show this morning, and somebody was asking about, like, the, you know, what are those equations in the background? Um, I realized that they're actually somewhat relevant to the subject matter of um, of the, the book that I was talking about on the show. So uh, the top, the, this bit here is... Um, the the critical density of the universe. So this is the number that determines whether the universe will continue expanding forever or contract, uh, you know, and and collapse on itself. So the idea is that the universe is currently expanding, and it sh you know you, the idea is that, that that all the gravity of the stuff in the universe should slow that expansion down. Right. The expansion started with the Big Bang, and then all the gravity of everything should be slowing it down. And 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 it was for a long time. It's not anymore. It's a complicated story. We can get to it later. Um, but uh, this critical density is the, the the density of where that would exactly balance, where the gravity of everything would have exactly balanced the uh, expansion. So that that's the border between a universe that continues expanding forever or stops expanding and, and collapses down. Um, so I was, I was talking about this with my th my um, research student, and she was coding something up. So I was explaining that, um, and that's why that's up there. And then this line here is um, is the Hubble parameter, which is the sort of current rate of expansion, or uh, in this case, the rate of expansion of the universe at different eras in the universe. And uh, so it's all about how to calculate how quickly the universe was expanding at different uh, at different times. And then the other the other lines are about calculating the how much matter there is in the universe at, at different times. And so um, it's all it's all connected to this idea that how the universe is expanding in the past, how it'll expand in the future, sort of determines the fate of the cosmos. What's great, great is, and this might only mean anything to uh, Helen, because you might just be old enough, is you are one soft toy away from being the BBC test card symbol of the <laughs> 1970s and 1980s. I mean nothing to you, Katie and Jen. You're probably too young to know that reference point as well. Thank you um, for making sorry. me feel good this morning. <laughs> well, yeah, I'm the oldest one. Don't worry. I'm just the, look, If science is about honesty... I know it says your lecturing age, your agent says lecturing age, 21 to 34, but there we are. Um, now, what have you got for show? I have something which actually speaks to two of these things because uh, it's an event. It's an event that happened the year before I was born, since you've just pointed out how old I am. Thank you. Um, and, but it actually speaks to, you know, when people look out into the universe, one of the things they get excited about is life on other planets. Now, I am a much more Earth-based person, but... I remember I did geology in my first year at university and there are two lectures that really stand out to me from first year geology. One of them was Simon Con Conway Morris getting very excited about copulating cephalopods in the fossil record. And the other one was this guy, Professor Van Andel. So this is his book. Um, and he gave a lecture called Serendipity. And the book, the, the reason I've got the book is I bought it because I asked him to sign it. It's one of the, the first time I ever asked someone to sign a book, this was. But the thing that was serendipitous, the thing that he talked about in that lecture was the discovery of deep sea vents, because he was on the first expedition that actually saw life on the vents. So not just that there were, you know, black smokers and things coming up from the deep sea, but they went down in a bathysphere, uh, in a submarine, and they saw things crawling around so many things crawling around and his lecture was this story of how they went and that you know they dropped these things down and they were like oh well we're just going to see some rocks that's quite interesting and then it's just full of life and it was such a gripping story and even though I went on to do physics it was one of the things that hooked me into the physics of earth that I've sort of come back to now and so I have this book still because um well because he signed it but because that the memory of that serendipity. And it's interesting, I think, because in a way, I feel that is us discovering alien life. Like the moment he describes is quite possibly the closest humanity will come to genuinely being sure that alien life exists because, you know, life in the ocean is pretty alien. It's pretty weird. The different rules apply. Um, it does have a common evolutionary ancestor if you go far enough back. But that shock of them actually finding it is what we've been waiting to replicate with exoplanets and the search for life. And, and, and maybe that was it. Maybe that's as close as we ever get. So anyway, so serendipity, that was his lecture. It's always stuck with me. That's brilliant. That's uh, what year was the book out? Um, so the book was first published in 1985, but the cruise, the expedition where they saw life on the black smokers was in 1977 on the Galapagos Ridge. Brilliant. That's uh, it's nice to ask for 
to ask for it. Once you ask people to sign books, it's not. There's no Patrick Moore got everyone. And whenever he did any show with anyone who he had the book of, he would always get them to sign it because he had no. It's like it's a nice thing when you've, you know, met someone or works or when when the work means something. I think. Right, Jen, we're going to start with you on the questions today. I'm sorry for insulting you, Helen. It wasn't meant as an insult. It was just <laughs> meant for accuracy. Well, it wasn't it meant for accuracy? I just it was. Oh man, well, we should all be less embarrassed about these things, right? You know, we we have interesting lives. We've been around the sun. I shouldn't <laughs> react to it in the way that I did, really. So it was right. just. That, you know, I'm, I'm, mention it. I'm, I, I'm the, young, <laughs> I'm the youngest of three and everyone thinks I'm the older brother. So not only am I the oldest here, I'm also the worst at aging as well. Yeah, but so we know we you spent a long time in the attic when you were working with Brian. We know. Yeah, I know. It's been it's the, the, the agony. Why I'm aging now when I'm at a reasonable distance from Brian and have been for the last few months, it's normally only proximity with the age what it's like? Happens. It's like time for you passes at different rates depending on how yeah, much yeah, you're yeah. living the, for the him. Yeah, yeah, yeah. proximity term. Like the, the then, relativity of the cocks. <laughs> yes. Yeah. For any, anyone who's Someone seen the Tony Scott film, well. The Hunger. Yeah, it's uh, so the first question, this is from Lily, who is six years old. And uh, feel free to pass the questions around as well, obviously. Uh, but Jen, uh, look, she would like to know, why isn't the Earth so bigger? Why does it end up being the size that it does? Oh, so the question of uh, planet formation and, and, and how the solar system came into being, I think, is still uh, an active topic of research. Um and especially because when we, we start, this is going to be me giving you a very long answer that basically boils down to we don't know. Um, but when we when we look at um, exoplanets, so planets going around um, other stars, we don't tend to, to see ones that look like our solar system. So a lot of the, the systems, the planetary systems going around other stars that, that we found have planets that like are as big as Jupiter, but like closer into their star than Mercury is to our to our sun. So I think the discovery of exoplanets has um, pulled up all these questions about how do how do planets form and why do you get your rocky planets and your gas planets and why do they end up in the bits of the solar system um, that they they end up in. Um, and yeah, I, I think there's there's probably and Katie might be able to to expand on this a little bit more. I would imagine there's um, kind of a, a limit to how big like a rocky planet. Um, can form that probably the gas giants um, because of what they're made of the differences um, the gas giants can get bigger but um, that's about as far as I can go with that that answer so that's a good question because I like starting with a question I can't fully answer. Casey uh, would you like to add anything or? Uh, yeah uh, yeah so so yeah it's it's true that um when, well so it's true that we don't understand planet formation very well um so that's uh, that's one one aspect um there's also this really interesting thing I, I was just reading about uh, a few weeks ago because a new result came out about it where um there there's a as as the as the planet forms, as planets form, um, if the if the core of the planet is large enough, it tends to attract a large uh, atmosphere of you know hydrogen and helium, and so so that's why you get these these gas giants in the outer solar system because you have so much uh, rocky stuff that's that's coming together. You also end up with a huge atmosphere, like it just has enough gravity to pull in a huge atmosphere. And there was a dis discovery a few weeks ago of a um, a planet that. Um, that was was a, a, a rocky uh, a rocky planet that didn't have a huge uh, atmosphere, um, and it was orbiting very close to its star. And there was this idea that maybe what happened was that it had been a gas giant, so it had had this huge atmosphere, and then something happened to it. It was like uh, some other planet passed by it too quickly, too close, or something, and it tore the atmosphere off. And so it was it was something that was it was too big to be just a rocky planet without a big atmosphere envelope um but it but it it was it was that and it looked like it was this sort of stripped core of a giant planet it was a very very cool um result that kind of gave gave some insight into this this process where the fact that those things aren't seen it was sort of a, a neptune sized um rocky planet the fact that those things aren't seen is a uh is a, a, a clue to to the formation of these things. So generally speaking, I, it, I mean, I'm not a planetary scientist, so so this is all sort of secondhand knowledge for me. But um, but it seems that uh, that uh, once once a planet gets uh, too big, too massive, then it, it gains this huge atmosphere, and then there's crushing pressures, and it's very hard for the kind of life that we understand to to form on it. 
And that I think has also helped answer. Kevin, Kevin uh, had a question, which was, what is the smallest uh, that uh, a gas planet can be? What's the largest that a rocky planet can be? So, kind of, I think some of those elements have, have hopefully he's got some some clues in there. This is for um, Helen. Uh, this is from Jahid, who said, "This isn't an astrophysics question, but I'm sending it now while it's on my mind." Uh, is the old phrase "hot air rises" literally true, or is it more the reverse, where cold air is pulled down by gravity? Uh, it's uh, more. He's right. It's more the reverse that cold air is pulled down by gravity. So, that, so all of this you need to be on. The, you need gravity for it to have any convection, any buoyant. Like buoyancy depends on having gravity, and hot things tend. They don't. Doesn't always happen, but almost, almost always tend to expand. And so the same amount of matter just takes up more space. And what that means is that if you have another bit of gas next to it that's cooler, the atoms are closer together. Um, this one within a fixed volume just has more atoms, all the, it's all closer together. So it, really it's a battle for gravity is pulling on both and the one with more mass basically wins. So really it's a race, to, it's quite literally a race to the bottom. So we think of buoyancy in terms of things rising, but actually the things that are rising are being squeezed out of the way by the things that are better at being mm. pulled downwards. So, yeah, and this is why candles work, for example, that, you know, your candles, you, your hot stuff gets out of the way, it, it heats up, it rises and it goes up and it means it's gone and it draws in cooler air. So then you've got more oxygen that can combine with your fuel to form more combustion. So actually these convection currents are really, um, gravity is really important, but it is always the sinking that matters. And of course, it does really interesting things to flames on other planets. So I um, I played badminton, had badminton coaching for the first time last week. Badminton coach hasn't seen me for five months, came in. I've got a question for you. And it was about a fire extinguisher in a film, in a space thing. And he was like, why was it? What was in this fire extinguisher that it poisoned everyone? And basically, fire doesn't work like that in space. <laughs> so my badminton coaching session started with a five minute lesson on fire in space. Um, and then we got onto shuttles. But the point is that buoyancy is really important for all kinds of things we take for granted. But it absolutely is a race to the bottom, not so, it's being squeezed out of the way. So would a candle in on the space station burn out? Because it wouldn't yeah, have so that. What you get is you get these spherical flames. Because, yeah. there's, because unless you push it or blow at it in some way, it just runs out of oxygen in the middle. Because there's no reason for there's no reason for that gas to be refreshed. So I'm sure they do have some kind of fire extinguisher on the the space station, but it's pretty much it's likely to be blankets. I reckon I probably should have looked it up after that conversation. Um, but yeah, things do just the worst thing you could do on the space station if there was a fire is try and blow it out because you would just be bringing more oxygen in to keep the combustion going. Well, as we know, Apollo 13 started with a birthday cake accident, with a birthday cake accident so is, uh, which has often been covered up, of course. Uh, this is uh, this question for you, Jen. This is from uh, D1456. So I presume this is one of the AI programs which is trying to pass its Turing test. And uh, the, the, the wonder was, she or he wondered, how far away are we from having a real problem, if we're not at that point already, with the growing number of CubeSats from SpaceX, Amazon, etc.? I've heard astronomers on social media saying it's already an issue for observing. Depends yeah, I guess what you mean by uh, it kind of being a problem being an issue, certainly for observing from the Earth, um, these satellites um, already have a huge potential um, to, to cause problems for, for amateur astronomers and for professional um, observations. So I saw this being highlighted really well with the recent comet that was, was visible, Comet Neowise, and someone posted a picture that they tried to take and it was just completely streaked by these little white lines that were some of these, these satellites, um, the Elon Musk ones, the Starlinks that had happened to, to go across. Um, I think that there's conversations that are going on between between um, professional astronomers and, and companies like um, SpaceX to, to talk about how to to mitigate them. Um, my husband and I were actually talking about them the other the other night because um, we saw a bunch of them um, just after one of the launches. One of my friends texted me and said, Jen, why is the sky moving? And I went, <laughs> wait, what? <laughs> Have you been drinking too much? Um, and then I went outside and, and because they recently launched, they were just so bright, just these like little trains mm. of of dots going across the sky and he my husband was saying well we haven't seen any for a while and I think that as they go further up in their orbits um, they become less bright because the only reason we see satellites is because they're they're reflecting the sun's light and um, SpaceX had been talking about painting them um, so that they they don't reflect as much I think that will have a, a 
be a big help for the amateur astronomy side of things you know people who are wanting to do astrophotography as a hobby but you know when you're talking about these the most sensitive optical telescopes that we have um, even painting them will probably pick up some things and then you've got to remember as well that these satellites they're not just um, visible in the optical they're also um, going to cause a lot of interference in in the radio so my my background is in in radio astronomy and these satellites obviously if they're they're, they're the reason that that SpaceX um, are putting them up there one of the reasons is to um, do things like beaming um, internet down into remote parts of the world which is a you know a very worthwhile cause and I think we shouldn't lose sight of the fact that that's the kind of reasons why um, uh, a lot of the times these the satellites are being launched. Um, but if it's doing that, that's going to cause huge amounts of, of radio interference for, for our radio observations. So um, I've not been involved in, in those conversations directly. Um, I know it's um, from talking to other people, it's certainly um, an issue at the moment. It, it could maybe we're just about in the point where these things could be mitigated. But if, if all the satellites um, get launched, then that's going to cause a huge problem. Um, the other side of it is obviously just having so much stuff in space orbiting around the Earth that, um, you know, you get to the point of thinking about scenarios like at the start of gravity where satellites are crashing into other satellites and having this cascade effect of space junk um, going around the Earth, which is, yeah, another thing that that um, I'm not quite sure. I would hope and I would assume that every satellite that gets sent up at the moment, um, I believe you have to you have to have a plan for when that satellite's um, time comes to an end. So I think they, at the moment you either um, send it up to uh, what's called a graveyard orbit, um, so somewhere for, for further out, or you have a plan to have enough fuel or whatever to safely deorbit it so it comes back to Earth, it burns up in the atmosphere. But yeah, it, it worries me slightly. Uh, maybe I've watched um, disaster movies too many times. <laughs> well, so I interviewed an expert on that recently and they are terrified because the problem mm. is it only takes one mistake. Yeah. Um, and the other thing actually is the bandwidth, because the, 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 the bands they use to communicate are getting close to the bands that the weather Earth observation weather satellites use. They're nudging in. And so actually, if they start to take over those wavelengths and cause interference, it means it reduces our accuracy of being able to detect types of rain and clouds and the amount of water in the atmosphere. And that re that that means our weather, our accuracy in predicting weather might actually go backwards. And I, I, I think this have is observations that are as good. This is one of the th things where um, I'm, I'm very, very cautious about private companies coming you know kind of accelerating our our kind of space faring ways and and having more companies like SpaceX um, who are able to to launch and I don't know whether we've yet had those conversations about like responsibility and, and that kind of thing it's one thing when it's a government agency like the European Space Agency or NASA or JAXA or whoever it is um, you know there's accountability there there's there's things that have to be um, thought about but for private companies it's it's kind of a bit more open and I think with the these um these space link satellites you know no, no one kind of realized until they were up there what the the effects were going to be so yeah it's a bit bit, a bit concerning for me but we'll see what happens and there does seem to be we, we does can't seem help. to be we, we can't help but notice a certain amount of ego within the games that are uh, being played at times um i should just quickly say by the way an apology that uh about 15 minutes ago apparently we had a dropout of sound for a couple of minutes on youtube hopefully everything is working fine now but uh apologies to anyone watching who found that they, it wasn't your laptop there was some a technical problem um also a reminder by the way that we could probably fix that problem a lot quicker if you subscribe to us for our patreon um or just put something in the the tip jar so there we go these uh, th then, then we'll find a whole new system and we'll have a, a utopian way of doing our sunday science q a or whatever the proximity to utopia as we can get to this is about the big bang and this is an interesting question well i mean they're all interesting but this is because it involves the idea of a center and so i'm going to ask you this katie this is uh, from printers united said if the big bang occurred at the center of the universe and the universe is constantly expanding in every direction does that also mean the center of the universe is always the location of the observer therefore there is no no true center so that's there's quite a few things i think that's but I, I will hand that over to you okay um yeah so 
Oh, yeah, that, that, that question went in a different direction than I thought it would at the beginning. Um, so a lot of a lot of people ask about the, the center of the universe in terms of where did the expansion start or where does it all come from? And and um, the, the answer is that the expansion was everywhere. The Big Bang is a phenomenon that happened everywhere in the universe where what we think of as the Big Bang as physicists is just the idea that in the early times, the universe was hot and dense and sort of in some sense smaller than today. And so every part of the universe was hotter and denser than it is now. Um, and you can you can have that happen everywhere. And whether or not there was ever a singularity, so a, a sort of single point, um, you know, everything condensed into a single point, we don't know. Uh, and then we have reasons to, to be skeptical of the idea that there was ever a singularity. But what we do know is that that every part of space that we know about now was at some point hotter and denser um, than than it is today, and so you can think of the the Big Bang as it, it really happened everywhere, and the universe may be infinite in size, may always have been infinite in size, and just getting bigger. There is no center from which everything happened, and so the way it looks to an observer is if you are if you are in a, a point in the universe, any point in the universe, and the universe is expanding, what it'll look like is it'll look like everything is moving away from you, and and that'll happen. Where you are, it'll happen to you know somebody three galaxies over. They'll also see that everything is expanding away from them. So, so we are all at the centers of our own observable universes, meaning that that every every point you are at, um, you see the universe expanding around you. You see things moving away from you, and you have a limit out to which you can observe, which is the edge of the observable universe of your observable universe. Um, so there's a sphere around you of about 46 billion light years in dia in radius uh, out to which you cannot see past that because that limit is the limit where if if light left a certain point at the moment of the big bang it would only just be reaching you now and so the the distance where that that is true is about 46 billion light years right now so every every person every observer Anywhere in the universe is the center of their own observable universe, and that observable universe is the same size for everybody at the moment. Um, and it would have been a different size at different points in the, cos in the cosmic history. But, um, but yeah, so you can think of yourself as the center of the universe, or you can think of there is no center of the universe, whichever way you prefer, but, but there is no center we can go looking for and, and define. I like your joke in the book where you say, if you are egotistical enough to think you're the center of the universe, remember that everything's rushing away from you all at the same time as well. <laughs> the, um, yeah. This is, but that's an it. I mean, this is, a, sorry, I'm, I'm really, I, I kind of obsess about things that we picture or try to picture and how we then, for, especially for lay people like me who are not able to, to understand the, the equations. Because I was thinking, I was watching something about the Big Bang the other day, and, and it will always be illustrated in documentaries or certainly anecdotal, obviously, what I'm saying now from the ones I've seen. As a kind of explosion, as almost you know, a, a mm -hmm. and, and it expands out, and there is light, uh, which mm -hmm. is what the first three hundred thousand years is it roughly? There's 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 no light. Yeah. Um, well, well, the first three hundred eighty thousand years, the, it's uh, it's a the whole universe is a plasma, and then after that, it gets dark, and then and then you get galaxies after about half a billion years or something. So, so do, do you have a, is that, what would you say if you were trying to give people an illustration of that, uh, you know, back to the point where the, mm -hmm. the, of understanding, what do you think is the most useful? So, so the, the way, way I, I, I've, I have illustrated this sometimes and what I, the way I do it is, is just a, a blank white screen <laughs> that then sort of fades to a red screen to a, a black screen. Um, so that's what it would look like you were there. It would just be, it would be very, very bright. And then the brightness would fade and redden and then, then it would be dark. So at, at you know, in the beginning of, of what we know of the universe is, is full of plasma. It's like being inside a fire, um, only it's sort of a, a extra nuclear kind of fire. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, and, and you can't see around you, all you, all you have is, is this brightness around you. You can't see through it. Um, and then over time it, it dims and then, then you can see through it, but there's nothing to see because the stars haven't formed yet. So it, it's not, uh, it's not something that looks particularly exciting at the beginning because there's, there's just not that much going on, um, that other than, you know, this extraordinarily hot, dense state is cooling. 
brilliant. Thank you. I want you. to know whether anyone... little raised, like a haptic screen that goes up and down. Can someone arrange that, Jen? Can you get, you know, so that you feel the brightness and there's a little hill and then it mm. goes away and then you feel the galaxies popping up. Has anyone, someone should do that, I feel. That'd be cool. Yeah. I have seen, um, I have seen a, a, a 3D printed, a 3D printed globe of the cosmic microwave background, mm -hmm. which is uh, the cosmic microwave background is the is the afterglow of the Big Bang, where um, we have this glow around us in the cosmos at that at the edge of our observable universe, because that's where you're seeing back to the Big Bang. You see that primordial fire fire at the edge of of the universe, um, and it's got little it's got little ripples in it. Basically, there's little little spots in it from places where the the fire was a little bit hotter or a little bit cooler um I'm, I'm i keep saying fire and people might take issue with that if they're being very technical but don't um <laughs> so um anyway there are places where it's a little bit hotter a little bit cooler and so it's a sort of bumpy picture and, and i've seen that made on a globe which is very cool and you can kind of feel the variations in the in the cosmic microwave background so that's the closest i've seen yeah well, i think it's jen go on sorry yeah, no, i was just gonna say i think it's an interesting uh thing to think about of how, as Helen said, like, how do you represent it? Because, um, you know, those first, first, like, years of the universe, those first 380,000 years, the universe, because we can't see it, as you say, what are the other ways maybe that we could represent them? Is there ways with vibrations or 3D printing mm -hmm. or whatever, having a tactile um, way? I've, I've heard, you know, audio versions of what the Big Bang would sound like and, and all mm -hmm. of that kind of stuff, but yeah. Yeah, because it would sound like because would because, sound like because because at that time space was loud, you know, mm. because there were these these fluctuations. There were there were you know um, uh, pressure waves going through this hot plasma, which is I think is very cool. Um, and so that would have been sound. We call it acoustic um, acoustic uh, you know um, peak or like uh, acoustic variation, acoustic waves, and it, it is sound. It's it's that the the universe was so dense it was loud. Helen, this one is from uh, the Reverend Richard Coles, uh, if you're watching. Richard, Richard hello. hello. Um, I'm this... impressed he tunes in. That's well, he might not. He might tweet, but it doesn't necessarily mean he watches. He <laughs> might have had a question some days ago. Um, this is, as, as usual, I always throw all the ecumenical matters towards you, Helen. And uh, don't worry, it's solar radiation. Um, as solar radiation increases, at what point does uh, life on Earth, as in our life, human life, become no longer viable? So is, is he referring to the sun kind of burning up, burning out? I, th I, th I think so. I think I that's think. so. I think that's what, as in that kind of, yeah. It, the, the reason it's an interesting question is because there's a difference between what you might need to get life started and what you need for it to continue. And actually, if you look at, if you treat, so I say quite often that the earth is just like a, a dam in, in a flow of, en in a river of energy and the energy comes from the sun. It kind of gets stuck in earth for a bit and eventually it, it, it flows out away into space, kind of through the cracks, through long wave radiation. And um, if you look at that flow through and you look at the amount of it that life uses, like, you know, plants that gets taken up in plants, it's a really small fraction. Most of it goes into shifting around water, frankly. <laughs> that's that's what it's doing. Um, and so there's a, the amount of energy you actually need for life to keep going is probably quite small. However, what you don't, if you lose all the other energy, the energy that is shunting the water and creating the weather and causing, you know, um, sort of irrigating things and causing rain, you lose all that help from the earth in maintaining your eco, your your environment. So, so I reckon if you were going to, you know, go to one of those sci-fi scenarios where you just existed in a little bubble in space and you had a perfectly efficient system and you just collected the sun's energy and used that to keep humans alive, a tiny bit of energy wouldn't take very much at all. So you keep going for a very long time. If you're talking about the amount of energy you need to run a planetary system and have a biosphere that's planet sized um, that produces the sorts of environment it needs for humans to live on, it's not quite as long, but it's still quite a long time. So we don't use if you use, if you, you know, there's some caveats around the word use, but we don't use very much of it. Um, so as long as we can adapt to Earth being a bit different, we could survive with a lot less. But I don't think we should try for that approach. <laughs> Not so um, I, I saw this question come in on Twitter. So I, I, I have a couple of things uh, to add to this. I, I like thinking about um, the end of the world. I don't go quite as far as Katie as the end of the universe. <laughs> but I do like thinking about that scenario about um, the, the, the Earth 
coming to its end um, because the, the sun has only uh, four and a half billion years left only into astronomers, you know, not so much time, four and a half billion years. And so a lot of people think, well, that's the point at which, you know, the, the sun will will um, shed off its outer layers. It will the core will collapse down. There, there won't be a, enough heat for, for life on Earth anymore. But actually, because in that process of um, the sun coming to the end of its life, it's slowly going to expand and get bigger and bigger and it'll get so big that Mercury will be inside it and then Venus will be inside it and then maybe the Earth will be inside it. We don't quite know because um, it's going to stretch out to be um, about as, as far out as where our orbit is. But in this process, the Earth will actually shift slightly further away from the sun because it's going to um, lose some mass. Um, and so there was a study that was done that um, said that in about, I think, 1.75 billion years um, around that point is when all the water on the Earth will have completely evaporated from the, the sun um, kind mm -hmm. of getting closer to us and heating up the Earth. So that, to me, is the end point. If we haven't um, got off this planet once there's no water, there's there's no hope. Um, the other thing that I, I notice is that apparently, and I've not looked into this, I'm not a solar physicist, but when you look at the activity of the sun, and this might be what the question was referring to, um, the sun goes on this 11-year cycle of activity and then quiet times. But when you look at the amount of basically, you know, the radiation coming from the sun in the quiet times, that's been slowly creeping up. Um, and so there is, uh, there's a, there's an instrument on the International Space Station at the moment that's wanting to measure that um, and, and see what the long term people start um, wanting to be able to blame climate change on this. Um, but I don't think there's enough evidence either way to say um, whether that, that, you know, the, the changes in the level of radiation coming from the sun is enough to, to push any of this climate change. I, I think it's very, for, can I just jump in? It's very clear that climate change has nothing, nothing to do with any of that. I was going to say, very, I am firmly, clear. there is very firmly strong the evidence that it might make a minor effect, but it is not causing climate change. Yeah, I'm firmly in the camp that humans are absolutely accelerating it and, and everything that's happening now is, is our fault. Um, but I think there is that question of what's the like, longer term um changes in the, the over over human longer term for humans not longer term for astronomers um changes <laughs> in um in the radiation coming from the sun and what kind of effects that would have um on the earth as i said there's no evidence yet um i think they they some uh, solar physicists at nasa have been studying it for about 40 years um from one of the reports i found and there's no evidence that it's having any effect uh, Jim, while, while, uh, Jim while, while we're talking about the end of the world, uh, the uh, this is uh, from Renato. would like to know, is it theoretically possible for a black hole to exist on a planet like Earth or Mars if the planet were big enough? Now, this is because, uh, of course, people will remember when the LHC uh, was, uh, was, was first operating. There were certain rumours going around, certain kind of conspiracy theories about these uh, small black holes that would come into existence and lead to the, the uh, end of the uh, end of the planet. So I, I think to be about me, black holes, to be, there's um, a bit of a difference between the types of black holes that we talk about. Um, so the black holes that I like, um, that I used to to study, are the supermassive black holes in the centres of galaxies. Those are maybe like a, a billion times um, the mass of the sun. And then you have your stellar black holes, which I think are probably the classic black holes that most people think about, which are the ones that come about at the end of a massive star's life. It goes supernova. Um, or you get hypernova and then you the core collapses down to black hole and then you have the kind of teeny tiny um black holes that it was the kind of thing that they were talking about could have could have formed with the the lhc turning on i think that's a re it's actually a really sad story the way that that was communicated i think at least one um person um took their own life because they were worried about the effect of that so i think it's not something to kind of kind of dismiss and i think it's a failing of us as scientists to have not um maybe communicated um that out better because um katie will probably be able to to expand on this much more but those kind of black holes that you're talking about they kind of in that scenario would have been created and then like evaporated pretty much straight away they can't they can't sustain their being if you like on on earth I think it's also not always just down to science. Just, just down to science communicating. I think it's also a few more pages of the newspaper and uh, yes. and yeah. mass news media would come in handy. Um, I'm going to ask you a, a follow up black hole question, Katie. So if you want to add anything okay. as well, this this is um, from Elizabeth who wants to know. I can't get my head around uh, something. I can't get my head around when it comes to black holes. Is doesn't a black hole always get bigger because it's eating the nearby space and matter? But then I thought Hawking radiation meant that it's also losing energy and also presumably size. So is this sort of yin and yang situation that keeps the black hole alive, so to speak? 
Ah, so um, uh, so black holes, the black holes that we know about, that we know exist in the cosmos, um, none of them are evaporating right now. So, so black hole evaporation, Hawking evaporation, is something that that happens if you if you have an isolated black hole that's just sitting there and there's nothing falling into it. There will be this kind of quantum process uh, near the the black hole event horizon, the the sort of edge of the black hole, where um, it will lose mass very slowly over time, and it'll speed up in the way it's losing mass as it gets smaller and smaller. For the massive black holes, the ones that we know about out there in the universe, they are pulling in matter. Um, we, generally speaking, only know about them because they are pulling in matter, uh, and. So those ones are growing. So the, 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 the evaporation process is so slow for a massive black hole, anything you know bigger than anything that could be formed by a star or something like that, um, that process would be so slow that anything that's falling in would massively um, uh, you know, overtake that. So, so those are, are gaining mass. Um, so yeah, so the, the way that the black hole mass changes, either fall, stuff falls in or if it's if you leave it alone long enough, or if it's small enough that it that it will evaporate. Um, but every all the black holes we know about are the ones that are are too massive to be evaporating at any uh, at any reasonable rate at the moment. Um, there, so in principle, if you could make a very small black hole, then it would evaporate quickly and it would be bright because it would be putting out all this radiation as it's evaporating. Uh, but we don't know how to make small black holes. Uh, so there's this this idea that the Large Hadron Collider could have done it was something that was sort of hoped for as a way of, we'd learn something about some interesting theories of gravity if if it had happened, if you had made these little black holes. But um, the, the, so the two points about the little black holes, well, three points about the little black holes, why we shouldn't worry about them, even though we do kind of hope that they do form at the Large Hadron Collider. Uh, one is that, um, yes, they would evaporate very quickly as far as, as far as we understand from the theory. Also, because the collision would never be so perfect that they would stop in midair, like it, they would be moving very quickly away from the Earth one way or another. Even if they went through, it would be so low mass that it would just go right through and leave very quickly. Um, and also anything that our particle colliders can do can be done, like has been done for billions and billions of years by cosmic rays out there in the universe. So we can't make a particle collider more powerful than the cosmic ray collisions that we know are happening out there in space. And so you have very similar particle collisions kind of happening out there in space, but at much higher speeds, much higher energies. And if those have not destroyed the universe or, you know, the moon or whatever, or, you know, created horrible things in our upper atmosphere like if that has not happened for the last billions and billions and billions of years then then us you know slamming stuff together at the at, at our machines is is nowhere near going to do it so How would you find uh, that's out? the I mean, thing I, I think they sound quite cute these little black holes but say you made a little little cute little black hole the lhc how do you know it's there because it's too small presumably to have any gravitational effect by definition it's either black or as you said it's radiating yeah well, so that'd be quite nice but how do you find a tiny so, black hole tiny so, black hole so there are two things you can look for. You can look for the Hawking radiation. So because it's so small, it would be radiating quite quite a lot very quickly and and um, more you know much more in one direction than another. So you'd be able to because it'd be moving. So you'd be able to see sort of a burst of radiation. Um, if it were not radiating, what you would see is missing energy. So you would see that the the collision happened, and you can count up all the debris, and there's something missing. Uh, from that debris that you don't get as much out as you put in, and that would t that would tell you that you made something interesting. So missing energy signatures are also used to look for dark matter because if we can create a dark matter particle, then you would also see a missing energy s signature. Right, we're we're pretty much at the at the, uh, the the end of the show. We've got we've had loads of great questions. I've got the the mass of the universe and the shape of the universe, and you can you can find stuff on this from from our guests. And we will, so we, so we'll, we'll we'll skip this. Uh, also, there's some way. Where, where's your story about being heckled by Stephen Hawking? By the way, uh, Katie. That's... Uh, oh, that's in a number of places. Um, there's uh, if you go to my website astrokatie.com, there there are a couple of links right on the sort of homepage, and and one of them is a. Um, is a, a podcast uh, where I talked about this um, 
for uh, the ABC, I think, a while ago, ago. So that might be the place the easiest oh, place to find it. Maybe that's where. Yeah, there's a, there's a nice oh, sorry, uh, uh, Leonard uh, Melodinov has got a, a, a new book about his friendship with Stephen Hawking. And uh, the first thing Stephen Hawking ever said to him was banana. And uh, there's a, a, a lovely uh, story about that first particular meeting. Um, Jen, where can people find, where's the best people, uh, place for them to find out what you're up to and the work that you're doing? Um, so I'm on Twitter, Jen underscore Gupta. That's probably the best place, although I think mostly I'm tweeting pictures of hedgehogs from my garden um i work for the institute of cosmology and gravitation at the university of portsmouth so you can google that and and find out some of the stuff i'm doing there as well i should there's an excellent there's there's an excellent there's a lovely little book called the hedgehog book which is by hugh warwick i don't know if you've ever met hugh or whether he was ever at one of the uh the christmas shows but but hugh is hugh's got a new book or he's he's a great hedgehog expert and he's uh uh yeah he's a lot of fun so the the final question we don't have time for whether dinosaurs if they'd had telescopes whether they could have uh, uh managed to work out some kind of technology to uh avoid the cataclysmic collision that uh seemed to be one of the main reasons that led to the end of them so instead let us merely talk about the end of the universe from each one of you, do you have a favourite scenario when it comes to the end of the universe? You may base this on scientific uh, supposition, <laughs> or it may well be something fantastical from your imagination. Oh, can Let's I start with you, Katie. Oh, go on, go on. Go on. I'm going to pick the obvious one. I think the restaurant at the end of the universe is a great thing. Let's all have a big viewing, very big viewing window. Let's all sit down to a nice dinner and watch it happen. I'm all on board with that. I really like transparent things so you can see how they work. So I really like the idea of the end of the universe being basically a transparent thing so you can see how it works just before you all snuff it. <laughs> so we all hope that eventually, you know, we, we, we go to the pub and we die in the sleep, our sleep at the end of that. It's yep. that kind of version yes. of the end, isn't it? Yes. Jen, yeah. what about for you? I don't know. I'm a bit more, a bit more cynical. As I said, I, I, I my time thinking about my how time. the universe in terms of humanity is going to end and how we're going to to screw it all up and, and kill our planet it's an interesting thing isn't it where the existential anxiety is in terms of because uh, um, uh, paul durak talked about the fact that you know he was totally you know, he was totally you know uh, happy with the, the or, or as far as you can be content with the end of his existence but when he found out you know when he started to think about the end of the universe that troubled him far more the fact that all of that physics that he had done not for his own ego but merely for the continuing building of knowledge the fact that all of that will be wiped out was far more mm-hmm. troubling to him to him than the termination of his consciousness. Yeah, I find it interesting for for each one. Of, you know, in terms it's of that like, existential yeah. anxiety, how it's does like it the change? library of Ale- library at Alexandria, isn't it? The fear, like the fear of every academic, is that knowledge would mm-hmm. be wasted or just lost. We are. I mean, we, even if we don't think of ourselves as hoarders, academics are fundamentally all hoarders of knowledge, and the idea yeah. it's like having to. I mean, Robin, yeah, I know you do this a lot, but it's like having to get rid of books. You know, you can't, it's very hard to get rid of a book. And academics are like, no, but it's, it's matters. People have thought things. Mm-hmm. We want to know what they thought. So we're all just hoarders. Maybe it's just going to clear up our hoarding habit. Well, yeah, thank it's, you. it's a very, oh, sorry. it's very hard. It's, it's just, it's a very hard thing to come to terms with the idea that, that knowledge will be forgotten. Um, that's, that's, the, that is definitely one of the most terrifying things for me about the end of the universe. Well, we end uh, the, the the end of the universe, uh, universe. But, uh, but there is no but the universe will return in Moonraker. No, that's it. But then again, also, we still don't know. So it's a um, thank you all uh, for joining us. And uh, as I said, uh, Katie has a, the uh, of, of everyone on has a book that's come out most recently. So we'll plug again the uh, the end of everything. And uh, hopefully we may well, as I said, that one of the things that we are planning on doing the nine lessons and carols for curious people that we do every year, if we are unable to do that, that uh, actually uh, physically with an audience in front of us we will our plan is to do uh, a, a big event at some point later in the year we'll be back next Sunday with another Sunday Science Q&A and if you check the Cosmic Shambles site etc uh, and Twitter feed and my own Twitter feed which I, I'm not on Twitter by the way that's that's all done by Trent so that's why I have no conversation with people there but that's where we'll also keep you up to date with who's going to be on next week and the questions you can ask don't forget Jay Wilgoose is on uh, the, the latest show and tell um, from Public Service Broadcasting which is a, a very very interesting conversation and uh, he ran out of things to show so eventually we just looked at his guitar it was lovely it was a great guitar and uh, and obviously all the book shambles are still up there and there's more book shambles coming and we've got tim harford coming up and various others thanks very much please do support us for our patreon if you can and uh, enjoy the week that you have ahead of you <laughs>